famous evolutionist Richard Dawkins says that animals only have the appearance of design. We'll see if that's true as we look at some amazing design in animals today on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Today we're talking about amazing design in living things, in animals. That's right. And uh, what does it show? Is this evidence for the creator God of the Bible or for evolution, as some evolutionists suggest? Right. The book of Romans 1.20 says that everyone can know that God exists. Yes. Because of what God made, right? But it's interesting to see how that those who want to deny uh, God, basically how they interpret the evidence that, that's before them. Yeah. For example, famous um, atheist and evolutionary promoter Richard Dawkins said that we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. <laughs> what's, what's he talking about here? He's an um, evolutionist, right? <laughs> <laughs> Bit of an odd statement yeah. from Dawkins. <laughs> but but, Dawkin, but um, designed is in quotes. He has that in the original there. Right. Uh, things appear to be designed. He's saying that... Um, Natural selection and genetic mutations create non-random, uh, a non-random process that produces design. Right. He actually says evolution isn't non-random. Yeah. Right? That's what he's saying. Yeah. The, the problem for neo-Darwinian theory, of course, is that in order for the mutation guided by natural selection scenario to work, is that mutations are simply spelling mistakes in already existing genetic instructions. That's, that's a huge problem. Right. Uh, and, and they haven't been observed to create brand new genetic information for forms and functions and features that never existed before. All we see are downhill changes that sometimes do something interesting, but they're downhill. Yeah. For the most part, they break things, not create new things. That's, yeah. that's what mutations do. And as for, uh, uh, as, uh, for what Richard Dawkins says, uh, he says that evolution isn't random. Mutations are ultimately... Random and randomness hasn't been shown to produce specified complexity, the specified complexity that we see in living things. Yeah. So coded information resulting in design is a power, or resulting from design, or coded information being designed into living things. That's a powerful evidence for creator, right. for a creator. The Life's God, actually characterized by high yeah. specified complexity. And, and uh, the leading evolutionary uh, origin of life researcher, Leslie Orgel, he, he actually confirmed this. He said, living things are distinguished by their specified complexity. Crystals such as granite fail to qualify as living because they lack complexity. Mixtures of random polymers fail to qualify because they lack specificity. Hmm. Now, unfortunately, uh, materialists like Orgel, of course, he, he refuses to make the connection between specified complexity and, and design, even though this is the, the pre precise criteria for, uh, for uh, design. Yeah, yeah. So to elaborate, a, a, a crystal, it's a repetitive arrangement of atoms, so it's ordered. It's ordered, right? yeah, uh, yeah. But such ordered structures usually have the lowest energy, so they form spontaneously, right, at, at low enough temperatures. And the right. information in the crystals is already present in their building blocks, for example, in the directional forces between their atoms. But yeah. proteins uh, and, and DNA, uh, and the most important large molecules of life, are not ordered in the same sense as being repetitive, uh, you know, a, as a crystal, but they have high specified complexity. So the difference between a crystal and DNA is like a difference between a book containing A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, repeated, and a book like Shakespeare. Right. Right. One's yeah. ordered and one's very specific, but, but they're completely different. And you understand that one can arise naturally, the other can't. It needs intelligent design. Right. The historian and philosopher of science, Stephen Meyer, concluded, we have not yet encountered any good in principle reason to exclude design from science. Design seems just as scientific or unscientific as its evolutionary competitors. An openness to empirical arguments for design is therefore a necessary condition of a fully rational historical biology. A rational historical biology must not only address the question which materialistic or naturalistic evolutionary scenario provides the most adequate explanation of biological complexity, but also the question, does a strictly materialistic evolutionary scenario or one involving 
intelligent agency or some other theory best explain the origin of biological complexity given all relevant evidence. To insist otherwise is to insist that materialism holds a metaphysically privileged position. Since there seems to be no reason to concede that assumption, I see no reason to concede that origin theories must be strictly naturalistic. Right, well he's got it right here. Simply dismissing design as an argument for a designer out of hand, and, and of course by that I mean the God of the Bible, yeah. um, it, it's disingenuous. What, what, what we're going to see next is some amazing design in, in animals, and of course what that's going to be is evidence for the grand designer, Jesus Christ. And we'll be back. In Job 40, in response to Job's questioning of God's wisdom, God sets out his credentials and challenges Job to answer a 77-question creation science exam. He says to Job, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. The exam covers the breadth of God's creative power, mentioning the wonders of many animals that we are familiar with, such as the lion, raven, deer, ox and ostrich. Finally, there is Leviathan, a terrifying aquatic creature with an impenetrable hide impervious to harpoons, fearsome teeth and a back covered in rows of shields. It even has firebrands streaming from its mouth and smoke from its nostrils. Though this may sound mythological to us, Job recognized it as a real creature. Indeed, one candidate from the fossil record is Sarcosuchus, a 12-meter or 40-foot monster with an unusual bulbous cavity at the end of its snout that could conceivably have been used for mixing fire-generating chemicals. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Today we're talking about amazing design in living things that implies a designer. Right. I did an article uh, called Pistol Packing Shrimp. Yes. Uh, uh, folks can look it up on the website. It features footage uh, of these, these shrimp in action and it demonstrates incredible design. Uh, the pistol shrimp normally has a, a regular claw and then it's got an oversized claw. And uh, this oversized claw actually operates as an acoustic weapon capable of producing gunshots reaching over 200 decibels, which is actually much louder than a jet engine. <laughs> And the sound that this shrimp uh, makes, it's not produced by its claws snapping together, but by a bubble that's formed uh, by fast water, uh, the fast water jet traveling at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour, squeezed out from a socket in the claw when it snaps shut. So, and, and this generates a, a low pressure bubble. And this violent implosion of the, the, this cavitation bubble produces the sound blast, um, which can actually, it, it's enough to kill a small fish. So in, in the video, you'll actually see this fish go by and the thing just points its boom and it shoots and kills this yeah. fish and then he eats them. <laughs> and uh, researchers using uh, high-speed cameras and sound equipment say that this whole uh, procedure occurs within 300 microseconds from the, when the shrimp pulls the, the, the trigger. Yeah, well, an interesting fact is that these shrimps are the dominant source of background noise in the ocean. <laughs> That's right. Uh, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. In colonies, they can interfere with submarine sonar. Yeah. The submarine sonar works on sound waves as well. Uh, the, the problem was first discovered in World War II because the creatures made it hard to detect hostile submarines. Exactly. And uh, not only are the gunshots used to attack, they're apparently used for a source of communication as well. Yeah, another interesting thing about them is they, they have a symbiotic relationship with the goby fish. And uh, this, this shrimp, it, it, it'll, it'll rest its antenna on the goby's tail. And then, uh, of course, they, they both benefit from this because if the, the shrimp can't really see well, but so if there's any, you know, anything dangerous or whatever like that, the goby signals that, uh, you know, that it's time for the shrimp to hide and he'll he'll go away. Uh, but in the return, the, the goby's allowed to share share the burrow of the the shrimp, and he doesn't shoot that that fish because yeah. he knows it's a help to him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Another clever trick that it has is it can switch hands. If if one of its claws gets lobbed off, it can grow that that claw, the gun or the other or the claw on the other arm. Yeah. That's pretty cool as yeah. well. Can't lose your, yep. lose your, your heat. Uh, <laughs> now, now, many people, when they look at something like this, they'd be astounded at the obvious design of such a creature. Yes. They'd say, well, yeah. how could features such as the building of the sonic gun and all the biochemical and neural pathways that be needed to integrate it into the creature's uh, central nervous system, how could that just happen by mutation and natural selection, right? right. But an informed evolutionist might make up a story and, and counter it something like this. Well, look, all shrimps have claws already with neural pathways for control of uh, closing a claw to catch prey. Okay. And some might even discover that by suddenly closing their jaw, uh, their claw, uh, it jets water at, a, at, a, at a, their prey and that, you know, creates some bubbles and that would disorient the, the creature and that would give it a long enough time to attack and then, and then, you know, progressively over millions of years that would just keep going until it developed this sonic weapon, uh, the sonic boom uh, would be the result of, uh, hmm. you know, modifying this. Now, 
Okay. Please understand. Right. We're not. I'm not <laughs> saying this as a as a straw man argument, trying to say this is what creationists have said specifically about the situation. What I'm using it as is an example of typical explanations that creationists will get presented with. Right. Yeah. When we try to sh show that this proves uh, a creator, of course. Yeah, and there's terminology like uh, some might even, or this could have happened this way, this could have been, right. and so on. It's commonly seen in, the, uh, seen in the evolutionary literature that highlights the fact that these kinds of arguments are from imagination. A just so story. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so neo-Darwinian evolution says that tiny changes in living things have to be useful at all stages. This is the way Richard Dawkins puts it. There cannot have been intermediate stages which were not beneficial. There's no room in natural selection for the sort of foresight argument that says, well, we've got to let it persist for the next million years and it'll start becoming useful. That doesn't work. There's got to be selection pressure all the way. That's Richard Dawkins. Right. But see, the pistol shrimp's claw, it's an extremely specialized construct, yeah, right? And yeah. it's a precise precision to, to, to create this, this uh, cavitation bubble. Of the millions of random mutations that could have possibly <laughs> happened that caused a little bump or, or a little groove or something to form, there would be so many other ones that weren't useful that wouldn't right. help the claw to actually work for what it's actually meant to use. It actually fights against uh, the, the position he's, he, he's mentioning yeah. here. And in the process, creating some bubbles, a little bit of bubbles, without the gun being activated yet, would have scared prey away. Right, rather than so, helping, yes. uh, helping the, the thing to work. So here's just one example. We've got some other ones coming up. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Creation.com is the world's most powerful internet resource for finding answers to questions about the origins debate. It includes an online store where you can browse through hundreds of the world's leading creationist books, DVDs and related materials. Scientists and researchers from around the world have contributed more than 8,000 articles, many of which have appeared in leading creationist publications over more than 30 years. Creation or evolution? When the results are in, which one is supported by scientific observations? Find out at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about amazing design in animals. We are. Yep. yep. Uh, what about termites? Here's another example. Termites. What about them? <laughs> uh, what about them? Yeah. There, termites can be real pests. Yeah. I mean, but yep. but uh, there's something else more interesting that we'll talk about yeah. than, than the pest. They, 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 can, they can eat a home inside out, yep. but the irony is that, that the homes they build are quite astonishing. Yep. These are cities, essentially, that house and feed and protect them with great efficiency. Just amazing design there and very little waste. Termite mounds can be as high as 9 meters or 30 feet. If, uh, if this were scaled up to human terms, it would be like building a structure two kilometers tall. Yep. It's incredible. And uh, not just any structure either, but they have a nursery, farms, uh, a massive ventilation network to keep the, uh, uh, to keep the building air conditioned and uh, a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Uh, temperature control, for example. Termite mounds can be found in climates with severe uh, climate you know, uh, variations, yes. extremes, yeah. where temperature uh, variation can be up to 30 degrees. Uh, Celsius, uh, huge, right? And uh, they have a number of ways to deal with that. In dry climates, uh, termites bury their nest beneath the mound, well below um, ground level. And despite the heat fluctuations on the surface, the soil acts as an enormous heat sink. And uh, due to this large thermal mass uh, of the surrounding soil, the temperature barely changes throughout the day. And then also, uh, the mounds are constructed to point towards the average position of the sun at midday, and this minimizes the area exposed to the sun's rays in the hottest part of the day, which helps keep the, the mounds, you know, temperature uh, constant. Oh, amazing design. Yeah. Um, living underground isn't an option for termites in, such, such, such as the magnetic termites of northern Australia. These guys right. are pretty interesting. They live in wetter climates. So an underground nest would be flooded in the wet season. So that, that wouldn't work. So they live above ground, of course. And um, uh, this brings the, col the colony much closer to daytime temperature extremes that you see there, especially in the dry season. So these termites orient the broad faces of their mounds east-west to help control the nest temperature. The colony also stays near the eastern face of the mound during the day because it affords the most constant temperature. Yeah. And, and many uh, termites uh, species have fungal farms. They, they have farms to feed their, their, yeah. uh, their people, so to speak. And they um, basically workers forage for bark and, uh, and they bring it back to the nest. And then fungus, uh, fungi live off the bark and make it more digestible and nutritious for the termites. Uh, for dry climate, uh, climate termites that live underground, this presents another problem, of course. How can they breathe? underground 
um, especially when the, the colony gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah, research has so, shown that termites, uh, termite mounds behave like lungs, enabling uh, uh, the colony to breathe. The mound is designed to capture small air currents and eddies in gusts of wind that vibrate at low frequency, and while air vibrating at higher frequencies isn't permitted to enter the mound. It's quite interesting with the phases there, the wind. Yep. The low frequency air is, is pushed essentially into the mound, down into the nest, by the force of the wind hitting the face of the mound. Likewise, the stale air is sucked up and out, again, by the force of the wind. Uh, this, combines, this combines an upward flow and an inward flow and so on, and uh, air is exchanged with the outside environment. So, yeah. pretty cool system. Yeah. So, the question is, uh, how do termites manage to build these masterpieces? I mean, humans haven't built anything yeah. that exceeds uh, the efficiency of a termite mound, yet termites aren't intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> There's no central authority. There's no, you know, planning. There's no boardroom meeting or staff meeting for yeah, these guys yeah. to, to do all this activity. So how do they do all this stuff? Yeah, right. pretty interesting. It's yeah. all done without, without uh, forethought or language. No individual insect is, is purposely, you know, the boss or working for the good of the whole. Yeah. Uh, this requires the right programming within each insect's DNA. Right. It's pre-programmed by God. Uh, programs require intelligence to write them in the first place. Right. Termites like ants. Uh, um, ants have no rulers, yet they can build amazing structures uh, that help them breathe and keep warm and, and, and moist, and, uh, and, and they have these farms that, that feed their grocery stores and stuff so they can eat and so on. The Bible long ago recognized the amazing diligence of ants. Yep. Um, in, in words, th these words apply just as much to termites, their, their, their fellow you know, social insects. It's, it says this, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food for harvest. And you can see that in Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. It's incredible. So termites and the masterpieces that they build are a testimony to our Creator, right? He, yes. he gave them yeah. the programming required so that the, the, even though they don't have the intelligence themselves, they produce such amazing wonders. And we're going to see some, see some more of this when we get back to this. Most people have experienced the frustration of failing to find a location because they've been given confusing directions. But even though humans can often be hopeless at giving directions, the humble honeybee manages to give excellent directions, even though it does so in a very unusual way. Scientists have long known that when honeybees discover a new food source, they return to the hive and perform a special dance that remarkably informs the other bees where to find the food. But this dancing mode of communication communication is so complicated that it took Austrian naturalist Karl von Frisch 20 years to decipher it. Since complicated dance routines require the planning and forethought of an intelligent choreographer, wouldn't it be reasonable to conclude that a super intelligent mind programmed the bees with this remarkable form of communication? To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, we're back and we're talking about amazing design in animals yes. and uh, God's designed few sites more incredible than, the, than a seahorse. Very yep. interesting creature, swims erect and slowly with his tail twisting, uh, you know, kind of gripping seaweed fronds as it moves around and it's got really alert eyes and um, they're, they're always looking for food and danger, of course. And, and seahorses make uh, popular saltwater aquarium pets. Uh, any, any public aquarium usually draws a crowd if they have, if they have seahorses there. And they usually uh, live along the shore, actually, uh, among seaweeds and other plants. They only have one mate. They generally don't travel more than a few meters, and they're pretty small anyway. They're only about uh, uh, 4 to 30 centimeters long, um, so that's probably a big enough space for them. And they continue to grow uh, throughout their uh, three years of life. And uh, they're very unique. They're, they're, uh, they have this protective bony armor, so strong it's almost impossible to crush a, a dead seahorse. They're very, very strong yeah, uh, not armor. Not that you'd want to. Not that you'd want <laughs> to, but uh, and it's kind of tough skeleton makes it a little unappetizing too for predators or you know, things like that. Seahorses are usually left alone in the, in the sea. But um, it's unique among fishes in that its head is, is set at right angles to its body. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it swims with its body held upright. It can bend its head up or down, but not from side to side, which is why its eyes are just 
designed to move independently as well. And they swivel about, kind of like a chameleon, uh, to watch each side. Yeah, seahorse uses its fins to swim vertically, uh, just like you just said, and it rises or sinks by uh, cleverly altering the volume of gas in its swim bladder, right. uh, much like a, a, a well-designed submarine does. Right. You have these, these, uh, uh, manip manip they manipulate the amount of gas in, uh, in order to submerge a submarine and, and resurface. Right. If this bladder is damaged, uh, if it loses even a tiny bit of gas, mm. it will sink to the bottom and lie helpless until it dies. Right. Uh, so uh, amazing. If the seahorse is a product of evolution, <laughs> how did how did this come about with this with, with, the, with a sw swim bladder, for example? Right. How uh, you existing before you have it, and if you do have another mechanism to keep you alive before you have the swim bladder, why <laughs> evolve the swim bladder? Right. Right. Th yeah. This is just one of the many design features in living things that, of course, support the, 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 the concept of the design inference. But probably the most amazing, if not bizarre, aspect of the seahorse is that it's the male that actually gives birth to the live young. And, and this has only been known about for yeah. the, about the past century. So the male has a, has a base uh, 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 in its abdomen uh, where it lacks the, the, the armor. And it's like a large skin pouch. It's got this little slit-like opening. And the female actually lays her eggs inside this pouch. And then the male fertilizes them as they're deposited. Okay. And, uh, she might continue laying eggs until the, the pouch is full, you know, many as 600 eggs. And then the, the lining inside the pouch becomes uh, sponge-like, filled with blood vessels, and uh, they play a part, of course, in nourishing the eggs. And this extraordinary characteristic of the, of the seahorse, um, when, when egg laying is complete, the, the, the dad-to-be, he swims off of this little swollen pouch there, and he's, he's like a living baby carriage. <laughs> right? He's got all these guys inside, and one or two months later, he gives birth to these little tiny replicas of, uh, of the adults. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So evolutionists are at a loss to account for, for this aspect of the seahorse's reproductive functions. Right. Uh, the whole process is simply too unorthodox. You, you've, you've, it's, it's just strange yep. in the animal community. Indeed, the whole makeup of the seahorse is something of an enigma. To, uh, to evolutionists. If one tries to explain it as a product of evolution, uh, as one authority said some years ago, the seahorse is in the category with the platypus as far as evolution is concerned. It presents an enigma that baffles and frustrates all theories that seek to account for it. Admit a divine designer and it's all accounted for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he got it right. Yeah. Uh, you know, design's evident in the seahorse, but the fossil record, that's another problem for, uh, for evolutionists because yeah. there are no representatives of seahorses in the fossil record that, you know, is a little less like a seahorse and a little more like something else. It's right. just the, the, the data is not there. So, um, yeah, the design argument, that's a, that's a powerful argument against the idea of naturalistic uh, uh, origins of the world we live in. And, and you know what? There are so many examples of this. I mean, we've just oh, had yeah. time well, we to, to touch upon a, a few. Two or three? Yeah, if you yeah. go to our website and just look up, uh, you know, on our Q&A site and look up design, there are just countless uh, examples of this. Yes. However, um, one book that we'd really recommend is this book here by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, By Design. By Design. And, uh, it, it, it's, <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, it's, it's uh, subtitled here, Evidence for Nature's Intelligent Designer, the God of the Bible. Of course, that's what we believe. Some people believe in, an, in, a, in a designer, but it's not the God of the Bible. Of course, we believe in, uh, in the Bible. And it, it is packed full of examples like this from animals that are absolutely mind-blowing to read. Yeah. So uh, you can get this book at 30% off if you go to our website, creation.com, and just use uh, the code CMLBD. You can get that book for 30% off its regular price. And we'll be back. With all the responsibilities that most pastors have, it is often too much to ask them to keep up with all the latest science that supports the Bible and creation. The Information Department at CMI reviews the leading evolutionary science publications so that our scientists and speakers are both constantly updated with the latest evolutionist information and able to refute it. Give your pastor a break. Book a CMI speaker into your church for a faith-strengthening Sunday morning message. Visit creation.com to contact your nearest CMI office. Well, we're uh, in the feedback section here today on Creation Magazine Live. And now what we're going to talk about isn't actually just a, a single feedback. This, this right. what, what happened is as the result of several people uh, mailing in over, over the years, uh, Gary Bates, uh, our... Um, CEO down in the uh, United States wrote an article called the knockout punch syndrome because of how many people would get back to us. See what happens is 
people often uh, get excited about creation, of course, and, and they, they hear some evidences, such as the ones we've, we've given today, several evidences yeah. that are in support of the Bible. And so they'll go to their, their uh, non-Christian friends or perhaps their Christian friends that believe in evolution. They'll say, well, look at this evidence. And, and you know, it doesn't convince them. And it's, well, what about this evidence? Well, what about this? And, and, yeah. and you keep throwing this stuff at them. And it, they don't always just make this miraculous turnaround in, in one instant, right? And so what happens is people, people want to say, well, look, forget about all these, these multiple streams of evidences you guys have here. Yeah. We just want the killer knockout yeah. punch. You know, what? this one killer diller deal that's just going to boom, and then, you know, they're going to recant and accept Jesus. and The, the magic <laughs> bullet or, or the knockout punch. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. And, um, you know, th there's a problem with that kind of idea because the problem is, is that you again think that evidence is the number, you, you, you think that a fact yeah. can convince somebody of something. But, but what we've been saying over and over again in, in Creation Magazine and Creation Magazine Live on our website is that facts don't prove anything. Facts are always interpreted. They need to be interpreted. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there, there have been facts, for example, that creationists have used or, or you know, facts that we thought were good proof of, of, uh, of, for creation, for example. Because we interpret them to be evidence for creation. Right. Yeah. Uh, the Japanese uh, um, plesiosaur. Remember the, the, the story that right. the, there's a picture, yes. there's yep. a Japanese trawler pulled up this, this creature out of the, and they caught it in their nets and they said, wow, it looks like a plesiosaur. They said, it looked like a plesiosaur. Yes. So and crazy. it still had you know, rotting flesh on it and that kind of thing. So it it obviously it wasn't millions of years old. That was the yeah, big news. Right. And of course, yeah. creationists last, latched onto that and said, this is, this is great proof. And this, you know, I'm just yeah. going to run around with this picture. See, we win. We win. We win. Like, yeah. you know, almost yeah. like that. But of course, uh, we actually have a, a portion on our website called Arguments We Feel Creationists Shouldn't Eat we shouldn't use. That's one of them. Why? Because it was most assuredly a basking shark. Yeah. yeah. We actually had someone from our organization investigate a, a basking shark. Uh, it was in Nova Scotia, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the way the front flukes rot, they rot off first. They leave this long uh, it stem. Looks like a neck. Looks like a neck. Yeah. And there's a bulb at the end. And of course, that's what the, you know. Yeah. So again, um, that would be a bad evidence to use, and if you're, it, it's kind of like cashing in. You know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna bet it all. Yeah, like on, that, on this one that thing. That wasn't a knockout punch. And Gary list, he listed that one here. He listed a number of other things: human and dinosaur footprints in the same rock in the in the, in the uh, the Glen Rose, the, 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 the River, River in Glen Rose, Texas. I was there a number of years ago, actually quite a number in the, in the 90s. Right. And, uh, and looking at those, um, have a look at that, uh, that website. Uh, uh, we'll put it up on the screen here. Yeah. The arguments creationists shouldn't use. We put that together as a help for the creationist community so that we wouldn't use the flaky evidences that have been discarded. As right. far back as the 80s, people started backing away from that and thinking, oh, okay, well, it's not as cut and dried as, as, as you think. You right. can read the details there. Yeah. So. And so really, you know, when, when people are looking for evidences, they're thinking of it the wrong way because the fact is evolutionists don't have more, more uh, evidences than creationists because no. we no. all have the same facts and we, are interp re or we interpret them according to what we pre-believe. Pre yes. So it's the same amount of evidences for both teams, so to speak. Um, if you'd like a free issue of Creation Magazine, you can just go to our website and just go creation.com slash free mag and you can get a free digital download. It'll give you a taste of some of the, the articles uh, that this show is based on. We'll see you next week.